are these people? This story, um, this story actually is a little bit more hopeful compared to the previous two, somewhat. Mm -hmm. Um, so and also this story went under the radar as would be. I just saw this on Twitter and I was intrigued by it. And actually, I was th debating whether I wanted to report on this now because this is related to this. So this is Morehouse. Those of you who don't know Morehouse, it's uh, all boys. All men, I should say, HBCU mm -hmm. based in Atlanta, uh, where I'm going to be in like a few hours from now. It's ridiculous. Um, so they had a town hall, I believe, last week regarding the president, the school president, who you st see standing there, uh, in, who invited Joe Biden to speak at their commencement in two weeks. Catch so they had a town hall. So they had a town hall to confront their school's president regarding what the fuck, basically. Mm. Um, so I think now this, I found this story before like everything, like obviously with the protests, were going on, but I think things have kind of taken a turn within the last 48 hours. So, you know, this story obviously will go under the radar. But I thought it was important to, I think, especially now to kind of share in the way of kind of thinking about this, what these men are saying here is probably some of the similar conversations that are being had in colleges right now in terms of divestment, which I think ultimately it's kind of like the crux of this segment is I want to kind of go into that divestment piece a little bit more. Um, but also I, and we, you know, this, those of you who watch the show since around this time last year, I did a segment regarding Biden spoke at Howard's commencement. I live in DC. Howard is in my vicinity. Uh, and me being essentially pissed off. That was actually a rant. Mm. Um, of me being pissed off at Howard's leadership for having Biden speak at their event when, you know, what has he done to benefit our Black young men and women who are about to graduate, well, last year, about to graduate. So I had my issues then. Uh, and now we're seeing things have taken a turn, I think, especially in light of what's happening in Gaza. And to see these young men actually stand up to their president and basically being like, these are the things that we disagree upon on, I think is very refreshing to see. So, so to give some context, um, this came from an article. So this is, the article was written, and I did link it in the description. This is from Capital B Atlanta, which is a nonprofit uh, newsletter. Um, so Chauncey Alcorn, is, I would say, a writer there. He wrote an article on this town hall. But what he also did was tweet it with video clips. So we're going to look at the video clips to see what was exactly what was being said at this town hall among the president, whose name is Dave Thomas, and then the Morehouse students. But I did link the article in the description if you do want to read it. Um, but if you're anything like me, I'm more of a visual learner. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of you prefer video versus reading. So we're going to do it that way. So we're basically going to go through the thread that Chauncey tweeted um, and go through each tweet mostly bit by bit. Um, so nice. we'll start with what Chauncey says. Um, so Capital B Atlanta was in the room, this was last Tuesday, when several Morehouse College students confronted the school president, David Thomas, about inviting Joe Biden to do the show's commencement ad address on May 19th. We're sharing the video to amplify everybody's voices, and we are too. Um, did I put? No, I didn't on this one. Um, not all of the slides have video. Um, some Morehouse students and faculty take issue with Biden's support for sending taxpayer-funded military aid to Israel amid the Gaza humanitarian crisis, 
which has left more than 34,000 Palestinians dead and millions more starving. Thomas made it clear he was the one who made the call to invite Biden. That call, he said, was made back in September before the terrorist group Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th and kicked off the latest bloody chapter in the seemingly endless Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So mm. here's a video. So you can play that. Video no longer exists. Oh. What? They did it again. They did it again. Did they just? Oh, um, Jesus. Here. What I'll do is I'll go to Twitter.com. Right. And then I'll go to at E L A M O N T I L P E S. Right. And just how about I go find that video for you? Look at that. They pinned it for us lovely people. Um. So this video right so here. That one. Yep. Look at me doing it. We'll do it Good live. Job. Thanks, Reed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Watch this. You ready? Let there be sound. Uh, that's Let's do it. A statement about the stature and yeah. importance of this institution. Uh, that invitation was sent out. Uh, we, we first started to explore it with the White House in September. Uh, prior to the events that have happened uh, as relates to Israel, Hamas, and Gaza. I made the call. So if folks want to bring hate, you hate on me. When the president speaks here, it speaks to the world. If someone wants to be president of the United States, they need to be willing to be on platforms where they can speak to the constituencies that are most important to the world. I declare that the road to the White House runs through Morehouse. That was before. What? Yeah, the road to the White House goes through Morehouse. He's I gonna go said, in a little bit more into that. It almost sounded like the blood of the White House runs through Morehouse. You know? No, he's going to elaborate more in a later clip, but he's just basically buttering the idea of like this is a big deal that mm. buyers kind of speak at our little college. Not not gotcha. so little, but like and who's this again? You know, that's this that's the African American he's the, he's Mr. Redenbacher. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, he's the school's president. Don't that man look like he's gonna so, sell you popcorn? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's got his own popcorn line. Um, October seventh, we set this in motion. We have a platform at Morehouse oh. that the world pays attention to. And we call people to that platform who are important in the world. The President of the United States is one of those people. Right. So basically okay. he's trying to make the case that by coming to Morehouse is a good thing. Um, mm. So next. Uh, we have graduation on track. Go to the next one. Um, zoom out, please. Uh, yes. Uh, Thomas stressed that he invited Biden by, by because a presidential visit underscores Morehouse's stature as an elite institution. I declare that the road to the White House runs through Morehouse. He said, we don't have to play that because we kind of heard him say it already. Just heard it. Uh, next one. One student questioned whether Biden's visit and giving him an honorary degree makes Morehouse complicit in genocide. Thomas said that question has kept me up at night. So let's see this king challenge Thomas. He's saying there is a, there's a uh, possibility of a genocide happening. And we're seeing our government continually sending more and more weapons, 2,000 pound bombs, that are being dropped on whole neighborhoods, schools being destroyed, hospitals being destroyed, 
And all our government can say is, well, we're gonna ask the Israelis what happened in this situation after situation after situation. And there's no accountability for what we're seeing with our own eyes. We're giving him that Morehouse, um, we're giving him that Morehouse degree, that honorary doctorate saying, you're one of us. Now we're complicit in what he's doing. So how, how do you justify what, what you're going to bestow on him on our behalf when he's doing, he's basically a war criminal at this point. What you just said is the thing that has kept me up at night. We have a diversity of views in our community and we have an opportunity to express those views on this issue. So that his invitation does not mean that we as a community are in agreement or yeah, so Robbie mm -hmm. in the chat said, looks like there were 15 people there. I think, according to the article, I think there was 50. But still, it's, yeah, you would think, in my mind, that the idea of Biden coming to speak and knowing, you know, what's happening in Gaza, Gaza there should have been a lot more people than that. I like, you know, I like but that being said... He, he admitted yeah. he admitted that he's having trouble sleeping, you know. Maybe right. That should, maybe that should tell you something. I mean, he might have trouble for a hot second. Right. <laughs> you know, but um, so next one. So Thomas said, um, zoom out for a second, please. Oh, yeah. He said, has decided not to reverse course on Biden's invite. He said right. Biden's Body of work over 50 years merits an honorary Morehouse degree and that the world will see that as a school being complicit in the atrocities that the Israeli military you're, are committing in Gaza. Your own students already see it as that. Right? So, the world already I, sees it as that, homie. I hate to tell you. And... We're going to get into his body of work later, yeah. Uh, just for shits and giggles. Um, but we don't need to play this because he kind of already said uh, in the previous clip. I want to get more to the students rather than listen to his dumbass. Um, so when asked whether he thought what was happening in Gaza is a genocide, Yeah, we'll just play. It's Roll the clip. Right now, <laughs> I'm being told that we need to use our platform as Morehouse men. Um, why are we using it to support someone who hasn't been supporting Palestine and Gaza and things like that? How are we being global cosmopolitan citizens? What does, what precedent does that set for freshmen? There's a, a possibility of a genocide happening. And we're seeing our government continually sending more and more weapons, 2,000 pound bombs that are being dropped on whole neighborhoods, schools being destroyed, hospitals being destroyed. You can what's happening, man. Children are dying. Innocent people being blown up. And you can see the videos and you can't deny the videos. And we, we don't condemn that. We say, well, the world might not see it as, oh, we complicit. You know, we see it as we complicit. We as soon as telling you, we see it as that's being complicit. Do y'all see that? Okay. Right. Yeah, that's complicit. Said the same. That's complicit in genocide. Do you think it's a genocide or not? Let me just ask a question everybody wants to hear. Do you think I mean, it's, it's a, a genocide nice hat. or do you not think it's a genocide what's happening in Gaza? Simple yes or no. Solomon. Yes or no. Is it a genocide? That's a fucking painting right there. Personal, professional opinion. Just that right there. Right. Like, you know. As an educator, as a man of this country, what do you think? Are the people of Gaza being genocided, or are they not? Um, I'm not going to answer that question. Motherfucker! Why? <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> it's such a I mean, damn I man. want to laugh. I want to laugh, but at the same time, I can't because <laughs> I'm going to say this is coonery. That is that <laughs> right here. It is. Yeah. It is like, uh, and like again, shout out. We don't see this often, you know. We see P 
people of color articulate, know the situation, research the situation. Well, I mean, I'm sure they've seen a lot of this shit online. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, but they're coming in with facts in terms of what they're seeing and the reality of how it affects them as students. And the president has nothing to say regarding, he can't even say if it's a genocide or not. He prefers not to answer. Yeah. And we're going to get to why he can't answer <laughs> later. Yeah. Um, but there's always going to be one idiot yes. in the group. Right. Um, so this clown, or at least in the clip, is going to speak in terms of the fact that Biden is speaking is a good thing. Yeah. So let's see what this idiot says. We have one of the most influential people in the world uh, coming to Morehouse College to give y'all his knowledge, to give y'all the experiences that he's had. And he's been in the city, he's been in the city himself since, uh, from what going on 20 plus years at the moment, right? So instead of focusing more so on the politics of everything, I want you all to uh, take, a, take a step back um, and start to think more so about the benefits that are, that'll happen with him coming to speak for commission in 2023, 2024. Yeah, but right? you can do that from the White House. At a town hall, no, he but he's not to talk about politics. But he's doing y'all. Uh, to disregard politics. I'm sorry. Wait, yes, so, so there, there are more than, than just the financial, there, there are financial repercussions that are going to come from this. There's going to be a media amount of support. So it's about money. It's not about the money. It's about the exposure. It's about the chance for the man knows. Can I talk? Can I talk? No. Hey, let him finish. So it's yeah. about Biden getting a chance to come to speak to some of the most brightest minds in, in America that are black young men. Bro, right? we saw you at the end of Eight Mile. We know what happens. M smokes you. <laughs> all right? Put the microphone down. We already know. <laughs> Tell us something we don't know. Uh, it's, it's fine for y'all to have a to have a, a a position or proposition, right? But at the same time, there should be no um, fighting, no 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 insults throwing at the moment. Because what I see right now is, is a serious amount of disrespect towards our president and then the president of the United States. <laughs> so again, y'all are uh, not supposed to have a certain type of um, opinion. <laughs> But you have to respect, you have to take the, the emotions out of it and think about the benefits that will come from having a, the influ most influential person in America comes to it. Uh, okay. In, in the end of the chat, saying counter. fuck free world, 313, fuck free world. I want to, this young <laughs> man, for a second. And people That's in the generous. chat, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be wrong on this. Didn't Biden speak at Morehouse at some point? I'm sure. And was like, I am going to cancel uh -huh. student loan debt uh -huh. for people who attended HBCUs who make under $125,000 a year. Did he give that to you? Now, I had an issue with that because I didn't attend an HBCU, but still, I'm surprised. Uh, we don't know, but I'm surprised that wasn't mentioned right. because Biden spoke at Morehouse to kind of announce that plan. And we do, and these young men, I'm fairly sure. Well, actually, <laughs> there was the story that I saw that I think. Like some rich black guy, I think maybe a year or two ago, gave Morehouse that year who graduated, he canceled their debt or whatever. So, so, so you're telling me Morehouse they, is worried about having less house? That's what you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying that Biden made a promise, and this cat is like the potential Biden coming to. Is going to be good for us. And I'm like, well, Biden, what has Biden done for you before this? And what do you think he's going to do when he speaks at your college? What is he going to do after that? Like, Jews are heavily underfunded, sir. So, 
how has it offered you and your classmates anything for the betterment of your education? Not a damn thing. So as you no. said, he can take a seat. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mastermind, mm. I think Mastermind in the chat called this guy an uh, uncle, a nephew. Yeah, um, yeah. Tom. Nephew Tom. Um, sure. But mm. anyway, let's continue. One student said there should be parameters put on what Biden says during his speech. However, condemned Biden's support for seven billions in aid to Ukraine, while black folks in nice. Georgia and nationwide who voted for him are struggling to keep their homes. Thank you for bringing it back to the hood. Fucking Thank louder you. for the louder for the people in the back. Um, oh, action. He should not be able to exploit that opportunity by pushing any. Oh, I knew that man with the do rag was going to say something. I knew when I saw him get up earlier, that man had words to say. <laughs> that is that whole fit means I'm going to say something. He kind brought his I'm going to say some agenda or narrative like a track campaign. Suit on. All that should be barred. Yo, he's going to address us. Play he needs to be giving us something. Yeah. Play it back at the beginning. Let's give him the honor of coming and giving a speech. He should not be able to exploit that opportunity by pushing any kind of political agenda or narrative, mm -hmm. no campaign. All that should be barred. If he's going to address us, he needs to be giving us something, some kind of inspiration, nothing that has to do with his campaign. He's going to turn around and use it and let us know that we ain't black unless we vote him next election. It Real? We should have restrictions <laughs> on what he can say and can't say if you're just going to ignore what we think about him coming here in the first place. Even if he was invited before um, the genocide began in Gaza, what about the Ukraine? We've seen since around 2022 exorbitant amounts of money being sent overseas. And we have real problems here in the West End. Brother Revere pointed out that there's a supreme amount of poverty that is continuing to increase in our communities and throughout America. But we're bringing the president, who continues to ship our tax funds overseas and continues to ignore our needs. But we're bringing here to address his needs of his campaign. Oh. Oh. What? Oh, uh, t tell the this people is, again what. Run that back. This is and I, I, I know we got to get the fucking. The you know, green amount of power that is continuing to increase in our communities and throughout America, but we're bringing the president, who continues to ship our tax funds overseas and continues to ignore our needs, but we're bringing here to address his needs of his campaign. I mean, yeah, that's about the face you would make there, huh, guy? Um... <laughs> right. So Just, I love how they brought it back locally in terms of buying ship billions of dollars to Ukraine and Israel at this point. What have they gotten? But it's and what have they have have they benefited? Um, right. So anyway, things got tense when one student accused Thomas being paid to give fine the platform. Uh, we're going to see his reaction to what he said that, though. So go ahead. This call was made. This call was made. This call was made. This, this call was made. This call was made before we were in the moment that we're in now. Around Israel, Gaza, Hamas. I want to know if you've been paid to provide him a platform. You want to know what? If you have been paid to provide Biden a platform. Pause that. Rest. Pause that. So notice, like, this is the one time that I, like, laugh. Because every other statement, he's just... Duh, 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 duh. And then all of a sudden, like, someone accused him... This cat accused him like heard the bass in his voice right? right so again there might be something to this but that was the first like within this first this is the first time i think what we've seen that he was more agitated uh when it became about the accusation of him getting paid off so let's continue okay hey mom let me stop you right there. 
I have not been paid, I am not bought. I am not registered Democrat. I have never participated in a political campaign. I have never held a position in government. That question is an insult. Fuck you, no it's not. Where's the money, no, Lebowski? No. <laughs> no. And again, we I got some receipts. Not to say he's gotten paid, but he's benefiting in some way, shape, or form. So we'll get there. But you can finish this. Just let me finish out his statement. Here. Because you are a student here, I owe you the opportunity to do it. But I'm gonna call it out. To ask me if I've been bought, if I've been paid, is an insult. Now I tell you, I've been here seven years. Look at what I've done at this college and ask yourself, do you see one iota of evidence that I put my interests above this college? I, 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 I say that to you. Because I think of all of you as men. So I'm going to talk to you as a man who respects another man. So I just want to put that out. If anybody's wondering if I've been bought, I've been paid, the answer is no. Okay. Well, we'll see you later. All right. So next one. Yep. Um, Thomas also wanted to concerns Trace about him being a trustee for Vanguard Mutual Funds. We're going to get to them later. This assessment management firm has been accused of having investment in Israeli settlement in the West Bank. So. Have you seen this? And what was put in by thinks of you currently? What they think of me? Mm -hmm. in the leadership in the time. Haven't seen it. My leadership, my time, nope, nobody's shown it to me. I see nothing here about me for which I need to be ashamed or apologetic about. So I just want to be clear. If you look at this, what's being incited is, is emotion. But you said everything on there was stuff that you was proud of. No. You said that was stuff that you're not ashamed of. I said, I said there's nothing on here that I'm ashamed of that is factual. I'm on the board. I'm on the board of Vanguard Mutual Funds. They got that here. Anybody know what Vanguard Mutual Funds does? It has done more to democratize the ability of the average person to participate in the markets, in the stock markets, and bond markets of our country than any institution in the history of the world. It's free real estate. In the history of the world. Why did I choose to be on it? Because my father had a stroke. Don't lie. In he had never missed a day of work. And because he didn't have savings, he was instantly destitute. If Vanguard had existed and he had just invested from the time he was thirty, a hundred dollars a month. He would have had enough money to keep himself out of the worst disability institution in Kansas City, Missouri. What in the fucking black capitalism is this bullshit? <laughs> what is that? And if, if he could the sob story about his father, about you know, if, if his father could have invested a hundred dollars a month, bro, what you want him getting NFTs and crypto? What are you doing? Like, 
Just, just invest it. Diversify your bonds. Fucking mother watch if I watch too high too many times. Not high enough. Like. All right. You can uh, go back to the slides. Uh, yeah. Because I think that was the last video that I wanted to show Ooh. from that Fred. Um, I think it's. Um, I'm getting there. 53. Okay. 51, 52, 53. Um, there was a student challenge Thomas remarks about making Morehouse a road to the yeah. White House. We don't have to play that, but one student yeah. challenged Thomas remark about making Morehouse a road to the White House, saying he feels like the school is being made a tool of the White House. Yes. He compared to Donald Trump's recent visit to re re Trump's recent nearby to clarify Trump wasn't invited to Morehouse. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Uh, hold on. So let me go back a second. Um, Todd said Morehouse is in conversations with the White House. Oh. Um, okay. All right. Thomas said Morehouse is in conversations with the White House about doing more direct engagement with students during his visit, that he would raise the students' concerns with the White House. Okay, yeah, he will. All right, so let's get to some of this bullshit. So he mentioned, so... Here, before you start, our, our why, don't you, why don't you leave... Thomas. Why don't you leave Discord and come back real quick? Just see if it helps okay. your, your thing. Um, but yeah, Dr. Dr. David A. Thomas joins Vanguard's board of directors. Hey, you're back already. Look at that. Um, so hopefully that helps. Okay. Uh, so, so Dr. Thomas, uh, if you zoom in, yeah, I was written. So this is on there. This is on Vanguard's website that I pulled it from. So mm -hmm. this was from 2021. So he joins. The Vanguard. So he's a trustee yeah. uh, of Vanguard. So Vanguard today announced the election of Dr. David A. Thomas to its board of directors and to the board of trustees of each of the Vanguard funds. Dr. Thomas is the president of Morehouse. Um, uh, hold on. Yeah, can you zoom I don't know why in? that doesn't, yeah. doesn't work. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it, but President of Morehouse has more than 30 years of higher education leadership experience. Former H. Naylor Fitzhugh, professor of business administration at Harvard Business School, and the former dean of Georgetown, Georgetown uh, McDonough-Hughes School of Business. He previously served as an assistant professor at the Wharton School of Business at UPenn. Um, not going to read all of that, but basically, he's a trustee. Yeah. Uh, for Vanguard. So, what's the problem with Vanguard? Uh, pull this from Reuters um, from June 2021. Investor magnet Israel tarnished by Palestinian conflict, but pull still strong. Um, as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict's bloodiest chapter in years played out last month, the world's biggest sovereign wealth fund said it was dropping two Israeli companies, sounds like divestment, from its investment profile on humanitarian grounds. Acting on a recommendation by the 1.3 trillion Norwegian Funds Ethics Committee made in late 2020, the timing of that announcement was a coincidence. But oncoming during an 11 day battle in which hundreds of Palestinians died, again, pre October 7th, right? Yeah. It offered a brutal reminder of the ethical choices that global investors must make in exchange for parking money in a country that offers the rare combination of high and financial secure returns and an all but country coronavirus proved economy. Norway's wealth fund has among the biggest holdings in companies that the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights lists as raising most concerns due to their operations in the Palestinian territories, according to Reuters findings based on Retentive data at the to the end of March, like major investments in Israeli assets, the fund shows signs of a wholesale retreat from a 
country not subject to international sanctions, and Tel Aviv's tech and finance heavy stock market hit a record high on Monday. But players are drawing some lines with distance from active participation in business linked to possible abuses, a common criteria. The Norwegian fund dropped Shapir Engineering and Industry for building homes in Israeli settlements in the West Bank and Niv Real Estate for letting industri industrial buildings linked to those settlements. Both investments created an unacceptable risk that the companies contributed to systematic violations of the rights of individuals <coughs> Excuse me. in situations of war or conflict, the board of Norway Central Bank, which makes decisions based on the fund's ethical ethics watchdog's recommendations, said in its May 19 statement. As your peer so source and said the investment had been about $1 million, and in, there was no Israeli company that did not operate in or gain from the West Bank territories. And Naveen spokesman said that settlement properties had a mix of wealth, Jewish, Palestinian, and Israeli Arab tenants, and were a symbol of coexistence between populations. Israel regards the West Bank settlements as legitimate, and the OHCHR does not express a view on the legality of the activities of the companies on its standard base, which it updated last year. Other high-profile investors in those firms, which are mostly Israeli, include New Zealand's Sovereign Wealth Fund, the NC Super Fund, U.S. asset management giants BlackRock and Vanguard Group, money manager Charles Schwab Investment Management, and Cal Paris, the largest pu public U.S. pension fund. So, Young King mentioned that Basically, Vanguard is complicit in the settlements in the West Bank. And Thomas was like, nah, man, no, I'm good. So I was able to pull this up within five minutes. Mm. So now I want to, so not to say he might not know, but it proves, it kind of gives basis of what these young brothers were talking about. Like, He's complicit uh, in just in the pimping of the school in terms of having Biden come to Michigan as PR for them, you know, but also to kind of make nice in terms of thinking about what can it mean for Morehouse if Biden was to be there and they weren't having it in the slightest. So applause to them for actually calling out their president in terms of their displeasure of having Biden coming in, but also giving facts, which given what I just showed you really makes Thomas a scumbag in all, in, in, in all, in all intents and purposes. Anything more you want to say before we move on? No. I think you all right. So, all right. So let's get into this for a couple of minutes. So, Roy's article mentioned a little bit about divestment. Um, so I'm sorry, this might be a long segment. Um, we've been hearing the word divestment a lot, I think, especially in what's been happening at Columbia and other um, Protesters. colleges. Uh, these were some of the demands that, you know, students were making. I want to actually have, this is from PBS NewsHour. Just kind of giving, you know, what exactly is divestment and how realistic it is in terms of actually having that be a possibility in terms of meeting the demands of the students that have been actively asking for it. So you can go ahead. ...have said they want to see schools cut investments with Israeli companies that may benefit from the war in Gaza. They're also demanding schools divest from military weapons manufacturers and cut research and academic ties with other Israeli universities. We will accomplish divestment. We are going to stay here until that. Without divestment, the siege will not end. We need to put pressure now. Historically, this is how it has happened on many universities. And we are going to continue to push for that and we will not leave. 
We're going to get one of many perspectives now on the student protesters' demands of divestment, what it is and how it works. Charlie Eaton is assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Merced. He's also the author of the book Bankers in the Ivory Tower. Thanks so much for being with us. And we should say that the calls for divestment vary in scope from school to school, but on the specific matter of divesting endowments from any company linked to Israel or businesses that might be profiting from the war, how realistic is that for most major American colleges and universities? What does it actually require? Divestment is something that's technically very doable. Um, there's hundreds of uh, socially and environmentally responsible investment managers out there that any endowment could shift its funds into those uh, socially and environmentally responsible funds um, that have a, a range of criteria that guide their investment. So it's, it's a matter of a university finding an investment manager whose investment practices match the values and principles of the community. Aren't fiduciaries of a university's endowment, aren't they bound by a duty to increase the endowment's value, which is a responsibility that's unaffected by outside social pressure or ideology? Any endowment can be managed uh, to grow and to serve the university, of commu the university community, even while being managed in a way that's socially and environmentally responsible. And that's why many university endowments already have social responsibility guidelines for their endowment investments. The case of for-profit prison divestment, we've already seen at Columbia University, for example, we've already seen fossil fuel divestment from Columbia University and from uh, the University of California system where I work. So it's something where there is a precedence for doing this. Many major U.S. companies like Amazon, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, as I understand it, are or have been invested in Israel. These, these are the types of companies that are likely to be included in the portfolios of many American colleges and universities. What is the impact on a college's bottom line if they remove these kind of funds from their investment portfolios, these Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies? Yeah, well, I'm not in a position to, to say one way or the other whether a given company's uh, involvement in the Israeli economy accords with principles of justice or equity at a given university. But I can say there are many, many other assets that a school can invest in. There's no shortage of investment opportunities in our global economy that are socially responsible and can both grow the endowment and align the university's economic ties to the larger economy in a way that fits university values about uh, equity and justice. A spokesperson for NYU said the school is not considering Israeli divestment in part because its $5.9 billion endowment needs maximum returns, and this is a quote, to help the university fulfill its research and educational mission. What's the big picture risk here? The biggest risk here is that this issue is, uh, is opening fault lines in the university of community. And there is uh, a lot of concerns about freedom of speech on campus, concerns about uh, letting the university's values uh, and principles guide the university's uh, you know, on-campus life, but also how it's related to the larger economy. The NYU endowment is going to be fine no matter what they decide to do. There are plenty of corners of the global economy and the U.S. economy where the NYU endowment could be invested uh, and yield equitable returns. So I, I wouldn't be worried about investment returns. Instead, I think universities need to be asking themselves, what are our values? What are our principles? And how do we apply them in a consistent way where the entire university community feels part of that? Is there a way to do that without a university's endowment taking a hit? You look at Columbia University, you look at uh, the University of California endowment. The University of California has $150 billion uh, in assets under management across its right. endowments uh, and pension mm -hmm. funds. It divest divested from fossil fuels in 2020. The endowment's still doing fine. Uh, the Columbia Endowment is still doing fine. So I think it's possible to let justice and equity also guide endow endowment investment decisions without the endowment taking a hit. Charlie Eaton, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Merced. Thanks for your time and for your insights. We appreciate it. Thanks. I mean, so basically, they can divest if they wanted to and go into other sectors where it's a lot more socially justice driven. And, and I think especially for a lot of these schools, like we see Columbia and the, these schools have endowments of billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. Of, they have endowments of, they can run small, like I lived in Boston, like Harvard, Harvard basically owns Boston. Like, with the amount of, like, it, the endowment alone can run probably the entire state, honestly. So it's a question of whether they want, really want to divest into things that are 
a little bit more ethically driven. But the, the issue is, and you've probably figured it out, like a lot of these companies, Google, Amazon, Raytheon, Boeing, like make a lot of money. Colleges want to, um, you know, maximize their profit. Um, and yeah, so it, so it can be done. And going back to uh, Thomas at Morehouse, I think, this is my guess, he's trying to, my guess, he's trying to make Morehouse become more like an NYU in terms of having the right investments, having the right portfolio where they are able to grow and he will profit from that, given that, again, he's a trustee of Vanguard. So again, I think he's pimping himself for Biden as PR, but also for, for these other companies to say, look, I had Biden come to my school to speak at our commencement. And I'm also on the board of Vanguard. So you can come to me and we can talk, you know, and see what you can do for us in terms of our school, which I think also kind of speaks to the failure of the Biden administration in terms of what they claim to wanted to do for HBCUs in terms of their infrastructure and all that, that hasn't happened. So because of that now, a lot of these schools are going to the private sector to try and make up the difference and they're selling their souls to the devil while doing it. That's kind of how I kind of interpret that. Oh, I can hear you. Uh, you brought this Twitter post from at JV, I think. Yeah. Um... So I saw it this morning. Um, so actually, I'm I'm not, you know what? I'm going to ask the chat because this is Biden's, you know, misgivings since he's deserving of an honorary degree. I don't want to make this stream too long, but mm. um, really got so one you, more story, you can let so. us know. And, sure. Okay. Yeah. So it's seven minutes though. But mm. um, I'll read what it says in the tweet here. Um, kind of going back to this Morehouse idiot. Uh, so J.V. the Great tweeted, HBCUs shouldn't be inviting Joe Biden to their graduation ceremonies based on his history towards the Black community alone. Sadly, it took the Israel and Palestine conflict to speak out by accept more from HBCUs. Hashtag Morehouse. So let's see if Biden deserves the honorary degree from Morehouse that Thomas is willing to give. Go ahead. I'm not telling you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, and you ain't black. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African American yeah. who was articulate and bright and, and clean, nice looking guy. Biden recalling his early Senate career, bringing up two segregationist senators, Herman Talmadge and James Eastland, who called African Americans an inferior race. I was in a caucus with James O. Eastland, Biden said. He never called me boy, he always called me son. At least there was some civility. We got things done. The senators that he is speaking of with such adoration are individuals who made and built their reputation on segregation. The Ku Klux Klan celebrated the election of one of them. Using the word boy in the way he did uh, can cause hurt and pain, and we need a presidential nominee and leader of our party to be sensitive to that. My Democratic colleagues don't like me saying this. I think the two-party system is good for the South and good for the Negro, good for the Black. Other than the fact that they still call me boy, I don't think they've, I think they've changed their mind. I was also known to Robert C. Byrd was a parliamentary library, a keeper of the institution of the Senate, and he was the institution itself. For a lot of us, he was a friend. He was a mentor and he was a guy. 1987, he bragged about getting an award from George Wallace. Biden bragged about an award from the notorious segregationist Governor George Wallace and told the Philadelphia Inquirer, I think the Democratic Party could stand a liberal George Wallace, someone who's not afraid to stand up and offend people. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. Unlike the African-American community, with notable exceptions, the Latino community is an incredibly diverse community with incredibly different attitudes about different things. They're going to put you all back in chains. Biden was remarking to an audience in South Virginia that included hundreds of black voters. Hey, Haiti just quietly sunk into the Caribbean or rose up 300 feet. It wouldn't matter a whole but lot. The reason I was able to stay sequestered in my home is because some black woman was able to stack the grocery shelf. One thing Biden is being slammed for is the crime bill he helped write 25 years ago that many critics say resulted in mass incarceration, especially of young African-American men. Unless we do something about that cadre of young people, tens of thousands of them, Born out of wedlock, 
without parents, without supervision, without any structure, without any conscience developing. It did contribute to mass incarceration in our country. There's about 100,000 of them, if you want to be uh, rhetorically uh, extreme about it, that are the, who are the predators. They are beyond the pale, many of those people. We have no choice but to take them out of society. It's awful hard as well to get Latinx vaccinated as well. Why? They're worried that they'll be vaccinated and deported. Because I was 20, I'm like the token black or the token woman. I was the token young person. Even call centers was rushed overseas in the hundreds of thousands. How many times you get the call? I'd like to talk to you about your credit card. Again, you have to start off with what they start off with. There's less than 1% of the population of, of Iowa that is uh, African-American. There is probably less than uh, four or 5% of that is uh, our minorities. Um, what, what is in Washington? Uh, I think it's the vast majority. Yeah. So look, it goes back to what you start off with, what you're dealing with. If you were, you know, the emperor right now, you, you're running the show, what are the things that you would do? Lee Kuan Yew, who most foreign policy experts around the world say is the most, the wisest man in the Orient. Hunter once re refused a date because of his own Asian hate. In the 2019 exchange, his cousin Carolyn offers to set him up with one of her friends, to which Hunter replied, no yellow. But there's one more band member that I want you to meet. Ladies and gentlemen, our vocalist tonight, Michael Jackson. Michael, would you please stand? First son Hunter Biden repeatedly Jesus called his white attorney the the Michael, yeah. He's a grown man. He is the smartest man I know. Hunter Biden reportedly wrote to his attorney, quote, how much money do I owe you because, N-word, you better not be charging me Hennessy rates. In another message, Biden began a text to his attorney with OMG, N-word, and Biden responded at one point with true that N-word. He lied to voters, according to the New York Times, uh, quoting aides of, of Biden's, about having marched in the civil rights movement. And I got involved in the civil rights movement uh, just a kid. I came out of the civil rights movement. I was one of those guys that sat in and marched and all that stuff. And the New York Times reports, quote, more than once, advisors had gently reminded Mr. Biden of the problem with this formulation. He had not actually marched during the civil rights movement, and more than once, Mr. Biden assured them that he understood and kept telling the story anyway. That is really, really weird. The Washington Post has given President Biden uh, four Pinocchios. Liar, 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 liar. That's how I describe it. For claiming he was arrested as a teenager while attending a civil rights protest in Delaware. They write, quote, the primary source for this story is Biden. We've learned over the years that he's not always a reliable source. One chapter receiving fresh scrutiny comes from his earliest years in the Senate when he strongly opposed mandatory school busing. It was designed to achieve integration and a more equitable education. What's less known is how he followed the lead of some of the Senate's most fervent segregationists. Working with segregationists on an anti-busing agenda is very, very scary. 1977, Biden worried that his children would grow up in a, quote, racial, his words, jungle if integration is not done in a, quote, orderly way, whatever that means. On March 25th, 1977, Biden wrote, my bill strikes at the heart of the injustice of court-ordered busing. It prohibits the federal courts from disrupting our educational system. Biden sought and received support from Mississippi Senator James Eastland, the Democratic chairman of the Judiciary Committee and a leading symbol of Southern resistance to desegregation. I think the concept of busing, which implicit in that concept is the question you just asked, or the, the statement within the question you just asked, that we are going to integrate people so that they all have the same access and they learn to grow up with one another and, and, and all the rest, is a rejection of the whole movement of black pride, is a rejection of the entire black awareness concept, where black is beautiful, black culture should be studied, and the cultural awareness of the importance of their own identity, their own individuality. And I think that's a healthy, solid proposal. Oh, it's from the RNC, of course. <laughs> yeah, nice. but I mean, where's the lies? Uh, yeah, no, easy, easy op-ed. You can only put together, you can only put together what Biden has said. Yeah. So, you know, so, but I mean, given all of that, do you think he deserves an honorary degree from really no. anywhere? No. No, I'm surprised he has an actual degree, let alone an honorary one. So, right. you know. So, again, again, so, again, shout out to these Morehouse brothers who actually called out their pre president and basically called him a bitch for, like, you know, giving, you know, you're playing Uncle Tom, essentially. Yeah. You're playing Massa to Biden because you think that he's going to do something for you in terms of your university, and yet he has not done so prior to and probably will not do, you know, once he speaks at your college. So, again, I just, as I said earlier, I think he's essentially, Thomas is just trying to pimp out his yeah. school and probably himself mostly for his own benefit, but using Morehouse and these scholars as a shield um, for his own gain. Um, shout out to JB uh, for this. And again, as I said, I wanted to play this clip um, from Morehouse because I feel like these are the kind of talks that are being had right now in colleges right now in terms of divestment. 
Mm -hmm. um, I saw this clip from JB, and I think this guy breaks it down perfectly. And I know Savvy has talked about this, given that she was in higher ed. But this guy breaks it down and to essentially why these schools are not willing to divest from the portfolios that they have accrued. So go ahead. The reason universities don't crack down on white supremacist marches is because those do not affect their bottom line. That's it. There's no other reason they don't care. I heard somebody put it, universities are now banks that teach classes on the side. And as long as nothing hurts them enough to affect that, that's, everything else is PR. Because in the end, a couple hours of marching changes about as much as appeals to morality and ethics through proper administrative channels for divestment from Zionism. Israel is a U.S. proxy colony in the Middle East. We use them as a money printer, war laboratory, preying on the indigenous Palestinians. It's an avenue of money laundering, infosec, espionage, theft, either direct or indirect, of essential resources like rare minerals and fossil fuels. And all that is in turn fueled by STEM grads of American universities, who are the beneficiaries of massive corporate and federal funding, like from Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Department of Defense, and the NSF. This creates a symbiotic relationship, several orders of magnitude more profitable than things like arts, humanities, critical thinking, and community building. In other words, the average administration will view investment in war profiteering and by proxy Zionism as essential to the survival of their employer. In other words, they need it for their paycheck as they believe they have no choice but to crack down on every encampment by whatever means they feel they can get away with in order for their institute to survive. According to political scientist Erica Chenoweth, it only takes 3.5% of a population in any group to engage in sustained action before the demands become impossible to ignore. Some statistics. There are 18 million students in American universities right now. It would take around 600,000 of them to constitute that percentage among universities alone. Around half of them, so 9 million, would reach the percentage of 3.5% of our entire country. Student encampments were essential to ending the Vietnam War and apartheid South Africa, and that is why one of the only things that truly scares our government is when the students refuse to shut up. Mm -hmm. And this is why TikTok is in danger. Uh, yep. Because of stuff like this. Um, but yeah, essentially, it's to keep their bottom line, these leaders, and and I'll say this for someone who has worked, well, interned at a school at a very prestigious private school uh, in Boston, just outside Boston, many years ago. These presidents' job, their primary job, is to fundraise. They are the figureheads that they go to these people, that they basically sell themselves out in order to get the money from any company that is willing to give them to not only pay themselves, but to also help benefit. I want to school. directly address. Sorry. Oh, so sorry, Rishi. We'll see you in a minute. But like, but you know, like a lot of these colleges and universities, I want to they own property, they own land, they own a lot of shit. So really it's a question of what are they what is their full portfolio based upon that they can actually do things more equitably and more equi uh more ethical ties to them versus just selling your souls out for whatever uh which may or may not be aligned with the values of your school so mm. that's the issue that we have and this is, this is why students are protesting me now. And the fact right. that, and I said this to you earlier, I think, because um, I see a lot of people online basically being like, all oh, these rich white kids, you know, are, you, you know, stupid, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, like mommy and daddy, you know, or, you, you know, they're spoiled brats or whatever. Look, here's my take on this. The reality is for a lot of these students, especially those who are going to these Ivy Leagues, the fact that they're willing to protest and the fact that they're willing to use their privilege, because I think I said this to you and in the last night, yeah, I cannot do what they're doing necessarily as a Black person. If 
God forbid if I ever got into that situation in college to the point where they I would be arrested. Th that's it. I don't have like the capital behind me or the family name behind me that if I get arrested that way and that's on my record, that career-wise I would be okay. You know? Like, for many of these kids, who knows? But the idea that they're willing to use their privilege for people that, for all intents and purposes, that they have never met on the other side of the world who are desperate for liberation. And they're willing to essentially give up their livelihoods mm -hmm. in order for that to happen. I think in this case is a good thing. Yeah. I teach students for all intents and purposes who will go to the Columbia's, the Harvard's, the Yale's, the NYU's of the world. My kids are four and five years old. And I would hope that when they get to this age, that, that this is the type of stuff that they would be engaged in to be right. able to challenge the establishment in this way. And that is what scares these people. That's yeah. why this, the Columbia University chick send the cops in because they know the power that these college students have and they want to stifle that and they want to threaten them with essentially their lives in order to keep them lying. And, mm. and I think even right now what we're seeing in New York is backfiring because more schools have gotten engaged. So you lady having the cops come in or you Thomas basically being a shell to Biden is only going to make things worse for you within the next few months, especially at these graduations. Now, I hope back up going to Morehouse again. I hope that's why I was waiting to take. I hope he actually does go because I yeah. would love to see these guys call him out on stage. Yeah. That's why I didn't want to do the story initially because I was waiting to see, but you and other people forced me to do it now. So I'm going to do it now. So this mm. might be a part two to this. But so speaking of all of that, and I think this is a long time and I'm going to end here. Sorry, Reef, but You're good. Um, um, we're going to end with Richie. So I know Richie initially was kind of eh about what's happening, but I think given how things have grown and, P and college students have been a lot more vigilant. And as we've seen at Morehouse, you know, staying in the facts and kind of bringing the reality of what they're seeing in Gaza and how it applies to them on the local level, as well as how that affects them, you know, as far as the global stage. Um, you actually sent this to me. So, but I think he's, I think, based on what I've seen, he's definitely had a change of heart in this. Mm. So let's play what I want to end with this and what Richie has to say uh, to these college students who are actively making a case for Gaza right now. To directly address all the students who are protesting for Gaza and have set up encampments from Colombia to the Sorbonne right now, we have an opportunity to define history, to be remembered as a generation of resistance. The eyes of the whole world are upon you. Your protests have ignited a fire that has spread to Canada, to France, to Britain, and beyond. These are the largest student protests in American history since the Vietnam War, the most politically charged in France since 1968. We as a generation are saying to the world that Israel, Britain, and America are wrong. And we will not be part of their genocide against Arabs and Palestinians. We demand, we demand that these universities, many of which are complicit, divest immediately and unconditionally. And they will try to tell you that the protests are insensitive. They will claim that you don't understand the issue. Zionists will accuse you of being racist and that of which they are guilty. For we all know every Zionist accusation is a confession. You see, colonizers will come up with one million and one reasons to defend their racist occupation and why they think that the land they stole belongs to them. 
Right now, they are scared out of their wits. Because in order for Zionism and American imperialism to work, they need soft power. They require a good public image. And right now, we are interrupting their brunch by drawing attention to their crimes. And no, it's not going to be business as usual. These protests are effective, they are morally justified, and they are necessary. They are truly democratic in their nature. And that is precisely why the police are attacking you. The same military industrial complex that bombs Gaza arms the police that attack students on campus. The same police that beat up students on campus train with Israeli forces. The same knee that was on Khairi Hanun's neck was on George Floyd's neck and is now pressed upon Gaza's neck. Understand that we are engaging in resistance against imperialism, against Zionism, and against white supremacy. While the Israelis incur losses on the battlefield, this is another theater of war where they must be confronted and defeated. In the media, in civil society, in academia, in people's hearts and minds, Zionism must be exposed and we must all do our bit. People in Palestine are counting on you. Their very lives depend upon it. Unchecked, the imperialists plan to roll into Rafah and they're already building a pier in Gaza under the pretext of humanitarian aid to establish a military foothold and steal resources. Every second that goes by, someone is buried under the rubble, alive in Gaza, gasping for air or in pain, being starved to death. This is precisely why we must never give in. People across the entire Arab world all see what you're doing and they are proud of you. This is a solidarity that transcends race, religion, and politics. It is humanity at its best, at its purest and most vibrant form. Remember to always stay focused on the crimes of the occupation. Always, no matter what. Never give in to agitators. Never allow racists among your ranks. Remember the FBI will try to infiltrate you as they did to other movements and cause infighting or try to make you look bad. The more you continue, the more people you inspire to do the same across other campuses around the world. Occupy the lawns, occupy the classrooms, occupy the administrative buildings, the courtyards, occupy the entire damn university. How dare they tell you that this is wrong while they occupy Palestine and Syria and butcher its people. You're bringing drums to the protest, drum harder. You're screaming at the protest, scream harder. You brought a friend with you today, bring 10 tomorrow. You're now on the front lines. None of us are free until Palestine is free. Wake up, asshole. <clears throat> Richie, the only thing about you, pick an accent, please. <laughs> like, uh, I, like, I already at least international man of mystery, that. bro. You know, I get, them, I get them mixed up too. Don't worry about it. You know? No, but I mean, mm. but I think that's a great way to end. Uh, that was classic Richie. Um, the one that I, I want, met, I want to I, uh, watched initially and fell in love with. Um, you know, but he's right. You know, so I think to kind of we talked about despair earlier in the show, but I think, um, I think I want to anything, directly, in spite of the cops mm -hmm. last night, I think there is hope in terms of what we're seeing on campuses hasn't stopped. And I think for me personally, I think I'm still kind of have PTSD of why I saw the George Floyd protests in terms of people were so scared of Trump that they were willing to kind of put their eggs in the basket that is Biden and making the case for him at the protests, yeah. you know? And four years later, you know, the people, you know, who are complaining like Trump is making our lives hard, Biden will be better. And now Trump, now Biden is essentially doing the same thing um, that Trump did, except Trump was very like pompous about it. Like Biden, like who God knows where he is. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I just want to say like, to all these college students, you know, who are willing to give essentially their livelihoods to this. You know, I'm 
I'm in awe. And I think, and I see how colleges have, like, these encampments have been spreading and growing. And even in New York, like, they haven't stopped. Like, even though the encampments are no longer, like, not there anymore. But the protesting has not let up. If anything, it's spreading. And so, I mean, I'm going to say this, prepare oh, for y'all, prepare to have Trump. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh. no, any, any semblance of the youth vote that Biden had is gone. <laughs> and the longer this goes on, th the worse it's going to be for him, oh. you know, moving into the fall. So, so like I said, this might be a part two, depending on what, Morehouse does, but as I said, I hope they don't just sit back and watch Biden say his shit. I hope that they will take that opportunity to actually scream at him on stage. Uh, like, put Howard to shame. Um, I want to be able to report on a good story <laughs> in light of this. Well, you know, but anyway, put YouTube to shame too by going to kodashv.com slash indie news network and giving us your money. Out of them, you can scan that QR code on your screen and put exclamation mark donate in the chat. You can also, go to Rockfin and Rumble and subscribe there. 